I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. We are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming for another special guest episode in a series where I converse with classicists and ancient historians about either books or articles that they have published, their current research interests, or just unique classes and topics that they are teaching and exploring further. In today's special guest episode, I am joined by Dr. Denise Mikowski, professor of classics and affiliate of Black World Studies at Miami, Ohio University. She has written extensively on the politics of race and gender in antiquity and is currently at work on a project examining the role of eugenics in early 20th century classical scholarship. But in 2012, she published her book, Race, Antiquity, and Its Legacy, which will be the topic of today's conversation. It accounts for the various ways in which ancient cultures thought about race, including race as social practice and racial representations. We also dig into the Black Athena controversy a bit, and why the field of classics handled it so poorly. And so without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Denise Mikowski. Denise, thank you for coming on. Um, We've been trying to get this together for a while now. (laughs) For the (laughs) listeners, um, follow me on social media. You know, uh, Denise is in Miami, Ohio, and I've been down visiting a few times to her class. Her students are awesome. She'll talk about that, but when I leave this location, I'm going to miss going down and talking about 300 (laughs) with their students. (laughs) So yes, thank you for coming on uh, virtually. Sure, it's a pleasure. Um, We're going to talk about Denise's Race, Antiquity, and its Legacy book that she published in 2012, but we're also going to talk about some relatively newer research. As I like to do with all the guests that come on, uh, because I'm I'm deeply interested in how people got into classics and how they got into their specific research, because that can tell you a whole lot about where they're coming from. So would you want to start out by telling me your background with classics, how you got into Greek and Latin and race and antiquity, race studies? Sure. So um, when I was going to undergrad, I thought I wanted to be an archaeologist. So and in fact, I have a a BA in archaeology in addition to classics, but this is going to sound really old fashioned, but I was really interested in Virginia Woolf when I was in high school. And I read an essay of hers, which is sort of famous on not knowing Greek. And it was all about sort of cultural power of Greek and also her personal love of Greek. And so I thought, I'm going to learn Greek when I go to college. So unlike a lot of people, I never had Latin in high school. And I learned Greek before I learned Latin. And when I started taking Greek, I really just thought then that it became increasingly hard for me to imagine being an archaeologist because I just love language so much. And I love archaeology. I love what it can tell us. But for me, I just enjoy grappling with language and textuality. So by the end of my undergraduate experience, I thought I would just pursue more on the literary side. And I went to Duke University to get my PhD. It's a classical studies program. So they were really invested in having us experience all sorts of sides of classics. And even more eye-opening for me, I was part of an interdisciplinary group of students around the literature program at Duke. At the time that I was in graduate school, race theory was becoming really, really big. And so I was just exposed to a lot of that with these students. And I had never had anything like that in classics. And it just, it changed my world intellectually. I really, really wanted to think about how to bring those two things together. How could I bring together race theory and what people were thinking about race and bring it into classics? And Part of it is I remember one of the students in that group, I remember we were just at this group and she said, well, Denise, you know, you have to say something about race in your field. And I remember very vividly saying, well, we don't really talk about race in classics. And everybody laughed. And then I said, but I think maybe there's something that happens when Alexander the Great goes to Egypt. And I was just so, you know, trying to find something. And I'll never forget this. She turned to me and she said, you have to find out. And that was the genesis of everything. Katya sitting on my shoulder telling me, you have to find out, you have to find out. And so I just, however many years later, I won't count, but that's the kind of imperative that I feel is that I just really had to find out how to make race and the kind of questions that I wanted to answer possible to do in classics. And so that's really the genesis of my research area. So you published your book in 2012. Well, so I did a traditional PhD sort of in Propertius, and I was doing a lot of more more traditional work in classics, trying to get involved in like feminist theory and literature. And then on the side, I just really wanted to do this work on race. But I would say, you know, I was coming out of graduate school really around the time of the Black Athena controversy, and people in classics did not want to talk about race. So that was always a kind of thing I did on the side. It was not integrated. That was going to be my question. Was it considered kind of like taboo? Is that why you waited? 
take it a little while to get into it. Yeah, but people were much more polite because they would just say, you know, not that we don't want to talk about race. They would say race was not relevant in classics. I have had more conversations shut down by that than I can count. And, you know, they meant a lot of things by that. One of the things that they meant is that they didn't like the word. But a lot of what they meant, which was particularly frustrating to me, is they were using a very modern definition of race. They were using our modern idea that race is based on skin color. And it's very true that the ancient Greeks and Romans did not invest the type of racial meaning in skin color that we invest today. But that doesn't mean they didn't have other ways of thinking racially. But people in classics were really far behind people in other disciplines at mistaking the modern vision of race as some kind of universal definition. And I will say that drove me crazy because there was so much good work being done in other fields that said race is social and historical and it's determined by its time and place. And then I would go to classics and they would say there is no race in antiquity. What was the terminology being used at that point? The way the Greeks, you know, if there were Dorians and Ionians and inter-Greeks and then with non-Greeks, what was the term being used? So this was in the 90s and Jonathan Hall's um, ethnic identity and Greek antiquity had come out. And I would say by far, the preferred terminology was ethnicity. Some people kind of experimented with culture and cultural identity. But I think by far, ethnicity was the biggest placeholder for thinking about collective identity. And that work is phenomenal. I don't don't mean at all to say that that work wasn't important. But when you look at the history of the terminology of race and ethnicity, it's really clear that ethnicity as a term was introduced after the Second World War. And it was introduced because people were so taken aback by the Holocaust by what racial thinking had led to. And so they thought that we needed a term to rethink collective identity that would acknowledge that it's not a scientific fact. It doesn't come from human biology. And instead of thinking, oh, well, we've been misdefining race because race isn't based in biology. It's based in what we think about biology. People started to turn to ethnicity. And so the frustration for me was not that people in classics were using ethnicity, but that they were using it because they had misidentified race. That's the sort of, like my commitment to the word race became a very, very dogged commitment. In fact, at one point I was asked to write a book about multiculturalism and I refused because that wasn't the right word for me. I wanted to write something about race. So when the opportunity came up to to use that umbrella, you know, it's not that the information would have been different, but I wanted the term race. When that opportunity came up, it, it was a really great sort of moment because I was ready to write the book and I had the word that I wanted. It worked out. The classicist preferred ethnicity for sure. Race, antiquity, and its legacy is part of a series by Oxford University Press called Ancients and Moderns. Mm-hmm. Quite, quite a bit of medicine, magic, gender, slavery, that sort of stuff. I haven't, I haven't read a lot of it, but yeah, so that was that was your opportunity. Yeah, and, and like I say, it was the word that I wanted. You know, I, um, I had been paying attention certainly to research in ethnicity. You know, I think that there's very good work done under that umbrella, but I really, really wanted to say what I had to say about race, which, you know, first and foremost was we need the word in classics. I mean, if I had to sum up the race book in one sentence, I would say it's that was the goal of writing that book is we can't avoid this term just because we're uncomfortable with it. And we certainly can't avoid it because we're defining it wrong. Again, you know, race is not a biological concept. It is a way that we think. And only in recent years have we thought about race through biology. In the ancient world, they just didn't think that. They defined race by other features. So yeah, so let's talk about your book a little bit. Uh, uh, before we get into there, though, I, there was an article that you wrote on Eidolon, the, on James Baldwin. And one of the quotes that you ended on was pr- particularly poignant. And I think that's what we, I'm going I'm to read it out loud just before we start. It says, So as classicists, let's make it a priority to state clearly and repeatedly, if Europe was a world in which black men did not exist, it was a world in which white men did not exist either. So I think that's a good quote to start your book with, because your book attempts to uh, account for the way in which these ancient cultures thought about race, It's which is quite different than black and white or brown or whatever skin tone you can have. It was not physical appearance. It was heritage. Yeah. When you say that, or when I say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but when we say the Greeks and Romans weren't white, or when I say that, I often get deluged with email that says, you know, what an idiot you are. You know, have you looked at modern Greeks or have you looked at Greek statue and blah, 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 blah. And whiteness is not a biological fact. You know, a skin color is a biological fact. But when we say that the Greeks and Romans weren't white, what we mean, or what I mean, is that they invested zero significance in their skin color. They do not have a sense of being white. 
They do not have a sense of being connected to other quote unquote white people. When you read, for example, Roman literature, which has much more, let's say, foreign groups who are outlined, you will see that the Romans think of themselves as being as different from the ancient Germans as they were from the ancient Ethiopians. There is simply not a desire. It wouldn't even make sense for the Romans to think of people throughout Europe as being of the same race of them. There's just no evidence for that. And the word white itself might appear as an empirical description, but it really doesn't that much. And it just, it doesn't have the same meaning. So I think one of the, the biggest frustrations is just the fundamental miscommunication about that sentence. When you say the Greeks and Romans weren't white, I am not making a statement about the facticity of their skin color. I'm making a statement about the way that they perceived themselves in the world. They did not identify as white, you know, the, as an idea. It's an idea when it comes to race. It's not a facticity. So I look forward to getting lots of email telling me how stupid I am because I don't know DNA, but it's true. That is the fundamental thing. That's why there is a thing called whiteness studies now, because whiteness is an invention. It's an invention of the 19th century. It's a, it's a U.S. invention as well. There's a fabulous book, one of the first books in whiteness studies called How the Irish Became White. And it goes through the historical evidence about how in the United States, the Irish, their racial identity changed, not because their skin color changed, <laughs> but because social and historical and economic conditions changed. So that's what we say. And I think until, you know, people can get to the point of understanding that difference, we're just talking across each other. But, you know, the more you say it, the more I hope it will gain traction. And the more, you know, I, I like to write a sentence like that because it is so blunt. Yeah, it was very, very poignant and stuck out. It, it ended it very nicely, the, the article, which I'll put links into it in the show notes. Thank you. Well, James Baldwin, of course, can you can riff anything off of James Baldwin. He's just amazing. And then the second half of the book, so to speak, you trace the way Greeks and Romans, their racial ideologies continue to resonate into modern times. Talk a bit about European exploration and justify economic exploitation and that sort of stuff. Yeah. We're not going to get into that too much, but we'll get back to the, as you mentioned, we'll get back to the Black Athena one. I'm very fascinated by that. It's not what people think it is. That's the most interesting thing about Black Athena. Yeah. Its reputation precedes it. <laughs> it's not what people think. Oh, yeah. So let's start here with... You're a classicist historian. I guess the good, the best thing to start out would be to define your terms. So what does it mean to have an identity in the ancient world? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the biggest issues about writing this book is in some ways to me, the less dangerous thing is that, you know, Jonathan Hall chooses ethnicity, I choose race, but, but that's less dangerous to me than people who won't define their terminology. So, you know, knowing that that's my biggest critique of classics, trying to define it in the book, <laughs> <laughs> the moment that I got pinned down. And to me, you know, thinking about identity and, and intersectionality and all of the things that come into it, I would say that race is something that we should think about as a fundamental difference or something that people think is a fundamental difference. And Benjamin Isaac has some really good ways of thinking about this in his book on racism in classical antiquity, because it's tended in many eras to be linked to science. You know, we are naturally different. But it's also the case that race is about a choice. It's about choosing what differences we see as fundamental. People have done all sorts of studies that say that, you know, genetically our eye color is as meaningful as our skin color. Well, why don't we divide race by eye color? So race is a set of decisions about how to organize the world in ways that you think demarcate fundamental differences between human communities. I mean, that's the best I can get to it. But that makes it very close to how someone like Jonathan Hall uses ethnicity because ethnicity is a construction. And the important thing is to see that race is also a construction. It's a set of ideas about human variation, why people are different and what that means. And then race is also about consequences, what we do when we have defined those differences. So for me, the key is really the kind of the idea of the fundamental and the notion of putting people into categories. That's what race does. It puts groups into categories based on perceived differences that are fundamental. Do we know when this roughly started? Because I know a lot of, I mean, most of our sources tend to be Greek and Roman. So it's like, did the Egyptians think of the Greeks? Yeah, you know, I think that's the important question is I think that race has to be constructed by a perception of difference. And people are more likely, as you're suggesting, to develop those perceptions that people are different from them when they are actually encountering those people. And it can be in episodes like war, which is going to lead to a very specific type of what I call, it's not just my word, Omi and Winant came up with this really important sociologist, but racial formation. I like that word, the way that you form your ideas about race. And racial formations take place with 
within historical context. So at war, we get very different racial formations than we might get from stories about people or from economic exchange with people. So we really have to be attentive to the context. And that's really what I wanted to think about in the book is not saying, you know, how did the Greeks and Romans define race, but how did certain ideas about race emerge from certain types of encounters? And the Persian Wars would be, you know, a, an enormous example of that because we can see the Greeks absolutely drawing lines between themselves and the Persians and perceiving that line to be fundamental and to be articulated through a range of things. Ideas about freedom, ideas about political organization, democracy versus tyranny, ideas about social practices. So all of those are ways of building that difference and explaining that difference. But that's a great example of a racial formation in progress, the formation of the idea of Greeks as opposed to Persians, which then really kind of morphs into this larger idea of a barbarian. Yeah, so the book is structured, you have four chapters. Well, you start out with racial theory, then race as a social practice, and then racial representations. And then the final chapter is whose history. Did that come about organically? How did you come about the different chapters and the different topics that you wanted to talk about? Actually, kind of designing the structure of the book, I would say, was by far the hardest part of writing it because I, I wasn't really sure what the model was. And I had been teaching a lot of this material and there wasn't like a textbook available. So I'd been putting it all together myself and I was trying to think about what that was like and what I needed. And what seemed to me at the time, and, and this is true of disciplines other than the classics, is that study of race tended to be sort of limited to subdiscipline. So people would talk about race in literature and they would talk about race maybe in art. They wouldn't use the word race, but let's say ethnicity in literature, ethnicity in art, ethnicity in history. And part of what I wanted to do was to try to bring those disciplines together and just say, when we're studying representations of Egyptians in literature, we might also want to know what the tax policy was in Egypt during that time. And um, they're trying to really lay out a way in which those sub-disciplines had to speak to each other and to say, you know, a really holistic look at race has to look across all of these disciplines. And when I got that sort of in my mind, the first theme of the book was we need race and classics. The second theme of the book was, you know, we've got to try to bring sub-disciplines and classics. We've got to figure out how are archaeologists using these words and how are historians using these words. And so that was really behind the structure. And I'm, I'm really glad I set it up that way. I mean, you know, it might have been chronologically and there, there would have been all sorts of ways to think about that. Not that the other three books are any less important, but I, I particularly enjoyed the chapter on racial representations, how people thought of themselves and or others and like just the evidence. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I thought is people were too often sort of and I think this is about a lot of fields, but it's particularly true of classics that we get very limited in how we answer questions. So you sort of think, oh, what did the Greeks think about, you know, race? Well, Aristotle said, well, Aristotle isn't the only one that thought about, you know, we got used to kind of citing the typical people. So I wanted to separate that out. That's why I wanted to sort of say, this is the racial theory that often gets cited, but then there's all of these other things going on. There's these conversations in literature. There's these things going on in social history where people have to figure out how to even fill out a census. So that was really part of what I wanted to do was, you know, just to, to get away from the ways that classics kind of cites within itself and give certain authors more authority than other types of evidence. So I was trying to do all that. Of course, one of the weaknesses of the book is that you can't do everything, you know, so I had to choose case studies for each chapter. And yeah, I couldn't do everything. So that is a weakness of the book. <laughs> Um, but then the final chapter that you've already referenced, the modern stuff, it was actually, as you've indicated, it was the design of the series. And it actually turned out great because I'm not sure I would have included a chapter like that without the design of the series. But it really enabled me to start to think about the consequences. And so it ended up being a really satisfying chapter to write, but I'm not sure that would have been my impulse from the beginning. So it was it was really helpful. So you had mentioned Aristotle and, and then the traditional people who get quoted about race or ethnicity at that time in the ancient world. What are the predominant theories and what ancient authors put them forward? And how, why was it that they had such impact on like our modern thought? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, people who cite the Greeks now in terms of, you know, being white, what's really different, I think, about a lot of Greek texts is there's not a, a treatise that survives that says this is what race is. I mean, we just don't have that aside from maybe the Hippocratic essay, Airs, Waters, Places, which often gets only read by people who are interested in science, history of science. You know, you, we just don't have authors talking at length about this. So we have to kind of pick it up 
almost in practice. You know, they're not going to tell us what their theory of race is, but we'll see it when they apply it. And Herodotus is the great example of that. It would be really difficult to do a treatment of ideas about race and difference without talking about Herodotus. And he does have a very famous passage where one of his characters um, cites a definition of Greek identity. And that gets cited a lot in trying to think about what the Greeks thought 5th century Greek identity was based on. And as you know, I, I consider Greek identity a racial identity. So for me, that passage is, you know, what is racial identity based on? What does Herodotus, or at least this character, think that separates Greeks from others? And it's complicated because it's both an idea of blood, but also an idea of cultural practice, of things like religion. So it's it's a really interesting moment, but it is only a moment in his text. Herodotus doesn't explain it. You know, so that I think is the biggest challenge. We don't have a lot of treatises about race. We have to pick it up as it's being used. And that's the first time on the historical record we even see the word Greek. It's, a, it's in book eight when he, he says being Greek means having the same blood and language, common shrines of the gods and sacrifices and the same kinds of customs. And it's said in a very specific context. So people, you know, there are scholars who think, look, don't overread this passage. It's not meant to be this fundamental passage, but we kind of treat it that way because it's the only one we've got. It's the only time we really have someone saying Greek means this rather than something like Aeschylus's Persians. Aeschylus's Persians sort of gets close to that, but it's more doing that. You know, you'll see people giving speeches about how the gods are on the side of the Greeks during the Persian Wars. And so we say, aha, we have to kind of pull out from that. So that, that passage in Herodotus has a kind of outsized importance because someone is really laying it out, the definition of Greek identity. Other than that, we have to reconstruct it. And I think what you're referring to is there is a word, Helen, that precedes that fifth century, but it's really only in the shadow of the wars that it accumulates this idea that we would think of today as being a term that unites all of the Greek city-states. Edith Hall's book, Inventing the Barbarian, for anyone out there who wants to know more about this, is you know the absolute critical thing to look at for that. You just mentioned barbarian. I read somewhere that that actually is not really a word that the Greeks really use much. We just we have the barbaro phonoi or strange speaking, and that's kind of where that word came out of. Is that correct? So I think it gets used. It's, it's sort of like Helen. We can see some evidence of it, but it really becomes a major term of racial identification in the shadow of the Persian Wars. So that word really gains a kind of momentum and it becomes then the anti-Helen. So part of what the Greeks are doing then is they are defining what it means to be Greek through this opposing category. So what does it mean to be Greek? Being Greek means to not be a barbarian. And so the two of them emerge sort of side by side as ways of drawing that racial line between Greeks and others. I think I say in the book, it's the closest parallel to something like black and white today in the sense that conceptually it divides the world into supposedly only two categories. Of course, black and white can't quite do that today or doesn't quite do that today. And, you know, Greek and barbarian falls apart, but it's that idea. You have one thing and the opposite of that thing being used together to define one another racially. And I'm not supporting the, the use of black and white that way, but I'm, I'm saying that's a, a, an interesting way to think of a modern parallel. If you're looking for something that might seem like the way we do race today, that's the closest. The Romans have a spectrum. They do not have a kind of simple binary of us and everyone else. They have Romans and Ethiopians and Germans and everybody else and Gauls in particular. Um, so they don't quite have that, you know, us, anti-us. But the Greeks and barbarian distinction is really, really important for a time coming out of the Persian Wars interesting that the introspective philosophical Greeks have very little nuance when it comes to that. I, I mean, it's really interesting. And, you know, one of the things that I love to tell my students is, you know, Alexander the Great gets caught up in that, as do the Macedonians, because some Greeks really want to call Macedonians barbarians, and some people think that they are Greeks. So, you know, the most powerful man in the world at the time, so to speak, gets caught up in, in trying to or having to demonstrate that he is Helen rather than a Barbaros. It's, it's a really interesting, Alexander is fascinating in terms of the performance of his identity in and around these types of categories. So do we know, like before the Persian Wars, was it kind of just like a nebulous, like understanding of barbarian Greek divide? Or was that just kind of, these are Egyptians, they're not like the anti-Greek? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Edith Hall's book is really about the kind of, the power of Athenian tragedy to do certain things and communicate certain things. You know, if we're looking at authoritative texts before that period, of course, we would have to look at Homer. But I think that difference in Homer is sometimes not fundamental, which is sort of interesting. You know, the Greeks and Trojans, in some ways, are a lot more alike than they are different. 
And I think a lot of that is also, again, dependent on the historical context. I think when you look at other types of evidence in those early periods, the Greeks just aren't as engaged with the rest of the world as they are with one another. Jonathan Hall, you know, he does a really great job of laying out how important the identity within the polis is in this early period. And also the groups you mentioned before, what are often called sort of ethnic identities of Dorian and Ionian. But it's really only as the Greeks, you know, start to travel for various reasons that I think some of this racial thinking begins to transform because now the outside world is as pressing in how they define themselves as all of these skirmishes they're having with one another. And the Egyptians are a great case of that. Feroz Vesunia has written a great book about kind of Egypt in the Greek imaginary. Sometimes Egypt gets overstated, but sometimes it really gets understated. I think how important it is for the Greeks, especially when it comes to the rivalry, because the Egyptians are so much older in terms of their civilization. So I think they're all important, but I don't think it has the intensity of what will emerge as Greekness during the Persian Wars. And it doesn't have the label in the same way. There's not an idea of what is Greek in quite the same way, which is, you know, why people struggle with Homer, because, you know, they're all called Achaeans. You know, they're all called things that 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 word Greek doesn't exist yet. I always found it fascinating that you have this concept, this duality between Greek and non-Greek. But at the same time, if you look at like the Greek pantheon, say like the Persians were supposedly an ancestor of Perseus. And, and, and this also goes to do these people actually believe the myths? <laughs> so like, not necessarily, but like that just, you have this pantheon where you have these, at least traditions that all the various different people around the Mediterranean somehow came from like the Greek gods, but yet they're different from us. We're more Greek because we live on the mainland. And even, even, and even those Greeks that say live in Sicily kind of were considered at times second class. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make social practice a chapter in the book, because I do think there's an idea of what you want race to be, but it is often so much more complicated in practice. So I think there are these theories about race and who's who. But as you say, there's all sorts of passings between the two of them, exactly as you say, when the Persians try to manipulate Greek myth, so they look like they're descended from the same people. I don't know, I have such a, it's terrible, I have an Aristotelian mind and I don't like Aristotle, but I, I I like to lay things out. And I really wanted to lay out how are racial boundaries set? How do people decide what divides Greeks and Persians? But your question is really important because I'm as interested in how that line is crossed. And I'm not sure that came out as well in the book. You know, I, I wanted to do a lot more about passing and boundary crossing. And it just, you know, it was only so much I could do in the book. But I think, you know, that's what I'm interested in. It's not saying racial theory could account for everything. But look how interesting it is. They have this theory and then it's violated in so many ways in practice. So I really love that question. And I love to think about that. That's partially, you asked me um, a little bit before to talk about Hellenistic Egypt. That's partially what's so interesting to me about the documentary evidence from Egypt. Because, you know, the ways that people live their lives racially is so much more complicated than racial theory would lead us to suggest. Yeah, it, it just seems, I mean, from my perspective, it seems that it was way more about being an Athenian or being a Corinthian than it was about being a Greek. And it only really came about being Greek when it was a few certain instances. My listeners will know this, but like unlike the Romans, the Greeks never really unified. And even when they were under Alexander, or like the Hellenistic period, they like constantly kept splitting off and fighting. Um, it was never like a political unification. So it just makes any sort of formation of like an identity, like a complete identity, very difficult. One of the things that made Jonathan Hall's work so important, and you know, it's funny when you pick up words from people, but he used to use the word mobilize about identity. And I loved that idea because I think he really made it possible to think about identity as an active, a sort of process rather than just sort of passively something you are. And I think that's really important because as you're saying, like we shouldn't just think of Helen as a, an identity. We should think about who uses it. And one of the things that's really distorting about our evidence is how much louder Athens is. And there's a lot of speculation, partially because we don't have enough evidence, but there's a lot of speculation that the Athenians were more invested in the Greek identity than the other Greek city-states, partially because it could conceal what they were trying to achieve in the post-Persian war period. So they were trying to build this empire. So it's very convenient 
for them to be pushing this identity. And I think it's a lot less clear that the other Greek city states were equally invested in it. So I think your question is a really good one. Um, it's not just that there exists this dichotomy between Greek and barbarian, but who actually uses that and who promotes it. And it's very much promoted in Athenian tragedy. But if we had equivalent evidence from all sorts of other city states, would they be invested in that? I think people speculate probably not because they don't have the same motive for using it. In the same way, one of the things that first defined Greekness, Helen, during this period was the sort of capacity to be a democratic citizen. Well, you know, that's an amazing thing for Athens <laughs> to think about, you know, that as being essential to Greekness is the precise political system that they are promoting and adopting. And, you know, I'm not saying they were the only ones to do it, but, you know, you can see that that question of mobilization and who is using an identity and what it means, I think, is really critical. And that's, you know, really your question. It, it, these identities exist, but they really only have meaning when we start to track who is using using them, when are they using them, and for what purpose. And I think there's a lot of reason to believe that this is a very Athenian thing. So, for example, since most of our sources are Athenians, we'll just use those. Athenians, uh, citizens, political rights, only adult males. So foreigners or medics, they move to Athens, and so they like live the rest of their, their lives there. Say they're from like Thrace or from another Greek city-state. Do they still associate their identity as a Thracian or a Plataean or I'm a Corinthian? Or do they just come to see themselves as Athenians, but without like political rights? Like is a citizenship based, is, is that wrapped up in identity as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think probably people who do work on the inscriptional evidence would have a, a much better take on the broad practice of using that, you know, how people identified, you know, their identity. I have to say to me, like one of the things that, that most blew my mind, and this probably sounds obvious to, to people out there who are more, you know, immersed in this, but Aristotle himself was a medic. And so for him to be promoting as he does, I mean, he's one writer who really talks about Greekness and what the Greek citizen is. And I, I think it's fascinating to think about what he's got invested in that terminology and in associating himself with that terminology. He was so transient, like he kept moving. So it's not like he ever, he was from Stagera. So, so it's not like he didn't develop a love for his city state, but he just moved wherever he could get money. Yeah, but he does, he does mobilize this sort of, this idea of Greekness in interesting ways, given that he himself, you know, as you say, is, I would imagine, really complicated. But you could say the same thing about Herodotus. I mean, you know my interest in Artemisia. There's all sorts of questions about Herodotus and, and what his background, you know, who he was before he got to Athens, so to speak, how that impacts the way that he views the Athenian world. So I think, you know, part of this is, I think, is not a problem of the ancient Greeks. It's a problem of the filter we've put on them. And so it is kind of interesting to ask different kinds of questions, complicated question about how did they self-identify? And in what context? I mean, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to get into some of this Hellenistic Egypt material, because it's so fascinating to see in that moment when someone is paying a tax bill and they get a tax credit for being Greek, can they claim Greekness? You know, so there are all these questions. Are they Greek? What does that mean? You know, what does it mean to mobilize that identity there? What basis do they have for claiming it? Does the state recognize that basis? I mean, that's really what I was interested in. I know less about some of the inscriptional evidence and more about some of the papyrology from Egypt, but that's exactly the, that moment I was interested in. What is that public performance at that stake like? And who gets to call themselves Greek and not? And Greeks did get a tax break in Hellenistic Egypt. That's like this very sort of interesting way of thinking about Greekness, different from cultural privilege or some of the other things that might accrue. What does it mean to write into your tax code a break for uh, Hellenes. The earlier question that I had, it basically came about because at one point in the Peloponnesian War, I kind of thought about that because, you know, the reason Plataea came to mind is because the city state of Plataea was destroyed and the Athenians, probably due to their guilty conscience not coming to their aid, then gave them the survivor citizenship status and invited them to their city. So like, I always thought like those people and like their children and so forth, would they still consider themselves Plataean? Or would they basically, because they have a citizenship status, would they come to identify as Athenians? I guess, does one's ethnic heritage or racial heritage supersede everything in the formation of their own identity? Yeah, I share definitely your wish that we could know these things. I, I think, you know, it, it's hard because not only do we have those kinds of moments of decision very often, I mean, we do, but 
but we also don't have the explanations. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me is what language do people speak at home versus in public, um, especially during the Roman Empire, you know, a little bit different. But, you know, how does that identification work? Is there something going on at home, which I think happens with a lot of immigrant families into the United States, that's different from their public performance? How could we access both of those things and hear a kind of richer explanation of what that is like? I think it's it's too easy to get cynical and say people are taking I- identities on that are most advantageous to them. And I don't mean to say that they shouldn't or they don't, but I think there are other forces as well, including familial alliances. There's this wonderful uh, text among all of the um, school texts in Egypt where a student evidently wrote, you know, I do not want to learn Greek. I am stubborn. And it's this great moment because is this an example of, the, of an Egyptian student who's sort of making this broader claim about not wanting to learn Greek for sort of ethnic or racial reasons? Or is it just a student who finds ancient Greek really, really hard? We just don't have explanations in those moments. And I think, you know, given the history, especially of the United States, it would be really great for us to know more about those choices, because we've tended to view the ancient world so much and so inaccurately as this homogenous community. These decisions had to happen all the time, as you're saying. So I wish we could access them more. I think people are getting closer and closer, offering better and better hypotheses, but we just don't have the personal narratives. Yeah, I do think sometimes when I make my episodes together, most of the time I just synthesize things that I'm reading. Every now and then I'll stop and just ponder what the significance of things are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, that was great for me. I'm not a trained paparologist, but trying to to figure out how to work with quote unquote everyday people rather than literary characters. You know, I, I don't want to discount the fact that literary people and people involved in the production of texts are real people. Don't at me on this one. I totally get it. But to look at different kinds of evidence was really, really great. The more you look, the more limitations you encounter. That's the, the frustrating thing. If I can have tax documents, Ryan, why can't I have diaries? Why can't I have something else? So do you want to talk a little bit about how things were under the Romans? Yeah. So, I mean, there are all sorts of different things I was responding to when I was writing the race book. I kind of talked about some of them, the use of ethnicity, the sort of the complete erasure of the word race. I mean, you could not find it. But one of the things that was really kind of interesting to me is that at least in the literature I was looking at in, let's say, the 90s, people were get, were really invested in the idea of Roman citizenship. Roman citizenship is incredibly important, and it's it really circumscribed people's lives in ways I do not want to underestimate. But there was kind of this consensus that sort of the Romans used citizenship and placed it above other things so that there was no longer other types of distinctions. So part of what I wanted to think about in the Roman part of the book is to both recognize the importance of citizenship, but then also think about the ways the word Roman wasn't just a citizenship status, it was also a kind of racial identity. And, you know, you see people use using the word Roman, not just to mean a strict legal status, but all sorts of things, you know, Roman means more civilized or Roman means this. So I was trying to, you know, in that section, really think about ways we could try to get at Romanness a little bit more complicated and not only see it in terms of citizenship. And the Romans are way different from the Greeks in terms of citizenship. They were willing to give that out. Eventually, they were willing to give it out where a lot of the Greeks were not. So yeah, it's a, it's a completely different like thought process. Yeah. You know, it looks like I think sometimes the evidence is unequal, so I'm not sure we could come to hard and fast conclusions, but it certainly looks like there is much more manumission of slaves under the Roman Empire. So people sort of took that alongside the more open boundaries of citizenship to try to say that the Romans were less invested in policing certain kind of boundaries between themselves and others. And so I was just kind of using race as a way to think about, not to say that that's not true, but to try to nuance it a little bit more, because I think the Romans are really good at putting up boundaries when they want, but they're also really good at relaxing relaxing them when it is efficient to do so. One of the words that really got to me, and I'm working on trying to finish up something right now that talks about that is, you know, the idea that somehow the Romans were more tolerant. And it's true. I think that to me, the Romans are pragmatic. I mean, they're not going to come in and force you to use Latin if they don't have to. They are not going to come in and force you to change your religion if they don't have to. But if they have to, they will, you know? So I think there's, you know, this way we have to be careful about thinking about the Romans. And what I'm trying to argue in this thing I'm writing now is we have to look at their priorities. And and it's seems like for the Romans, the biggest priority is money. You know, if you pay your taxes, you can have as much cultural variation
valuation as you want. The minute you stop paying your taxes, then we start to have problems. And the Romans can be incredibly violent, as Judea attests. So I'm a little bit worried when people talk about the tolerance of Rome. And I found my students had that point of view as well. So I think we, you know, that's kind of what I've been thinking about a lot lately is how can we grapple with that differently by thinking about what was important to them. The Romans were, I guess, similar to the Persians in the sense that they didn't force religion or cultural stuff, pay your taxes and you don't revolt. The Egyptians and the Babylonians tend to revolt a lot, so there were problems. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which is funny because you're the picture we think of in East versus West, these intolerant, barbaric Persians, tyrannical despots. They were in many ways more tolerant than the Greeks. I'm sure that there are Roman historians who will at me after this, but I think what bothered me is when people would start to sort of act as if the Romans had been inherently more enlightened. And I think, you know, I I was just trying to switch that conversation, especially with my students who would say that, well, you know, they were so great. They let all these other people be citizens. And often it's just this terrible negative argument. They didn't kill those people. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, is that the criteria for tolerance? I mean, relatively for the time period. Yeah. I mean, you can think of like relatively, but to me, um, I just wanted to switch it to pragmatic. I mean, I think the Romans were just really pragmatic. A French scholar when I was in graduate school said to me that the Greeks are like the French and the Romans are like the British. And he meant that that the Greeks were much more invested in their culture as part of their kind of global enterprise. Now, we could have a lot of arguments about whether or not that is true, but certainly Greek culture spread. And, you know, his point was that the British just are not invested in that. They're not invested in spreading culture so much as they're invested in control and taxation. And I think that that's, you know, it's a useful distinction, as you say, because on the ground, surprising things happen. People can become citizens in really important and interesting ways. The boundaries do seem more fluid, but I'm not saying you're saying this, but when my students start talking about how tolerant they are, I thought we've got have a better language for this, to think a little bit more about the Romans putting energy toward what matters to the Romans. That might mean as a sidelight, they're more tolerant, but I don't think that was their goal. I don't think they have this enlightened view of the world. I think they have an extremely pragmatic view of the world and the resources that they want from it. To just follow up very quickly about your point about the Romans in general, I think it's useful also to, as you're suggesting, to distinguish the Greeks from the Romans. Because too often we say Greco-Roman, you know, and people are talking about Western civilization. And the Greeks and the Romans are two very different animals in the way that they perceive the world and their place in it. So that was part of the goal of the book then, was just to make sure that we recognize the diversity of interests racial formations, et cetera, during this moment that we kind of lump together as Greco-Roman antiquity. I do have a question talking about Greeks versus Romans. So at some point, the Romans conquer all of the Greek territories. So the Greeks at that point become Roman, but they're still Greek. So that's kind of what I wanted to pair apart by thinking about citizenship versus something else. Because Greek identity, and and this is, you know, someone like Tim Whitmarsh works on the second sophistic. I mean, that's, you know, a whole literary and textual, really, not just literary, but a whole textual field where people are trying to explore about what it means to be Greek under the Romans. So as, as you're suggesting, I don't think Greeks just become Romans. I think they become, you know, maybe to borrow a hyphenated idea of today, they become Roman Greeks or Greek Romans, or maybe that's not even a useful way to think about it. They become Greeks under the Romans. And I think that there's, there's a really good term in that this religious scholar, John Scott, well, he used, I'm not, I don't think he invented it, but he talked about proximate others and the ways that sometimes your most intense racial formations and the ways that you define differences are most intense toward people who are closer to you rather than those far away. And you could think of sort of in the United Kingdom today, some of the ways in which Scottish and English might be more heavily contested than other types of differences. That's a good way of thinking about Greeks and Romans. I think the Romans are really obsessed with defining that line between themselves and the Greeks, in part because they think of it as being quite close to them. It's still different. I don't think they think of themselves as the same race, but because they're closer, I think it's a more agonizing line for the Romans, especially as you know, everybody knows the famous Horace about Greek culture. Their anxiety toward Greek culture, I think, is part of that proximate otherness. Fascinating. Um, maybe I'll get there some at some point in the podcast. If I if I do cover it, it'll be from like the Greek perspective of the Romans. I think that'd be fascinating. I think that'd be a really useful kind of thread to follow. So you don't just let the Greeks be absorbed when it becomes. Rome, but you really continue to follow their history and their world. I think that'd be a great way to go about it. The other thing is, you know, you would definitely have to think about slavery because Romans really associate or they think a lot about the Greeks in terms of contemporary slavery. They have to teach their Roman boys. There you go. They had to be the pedagogues. Yep, exactly. Is there anything else you want to talk about Rome specifically? 
No, I guess I'll just say a very tiny, tiny thing about some of my work in race really got started, especially when I was this graduate student in this interdisciplinary group of students in thinking about Cleopatra. She's not the only figure in my introduction, but she's a pretty important figure because she was has been really useful for me over the years in thinking about some of the things that I want to say. So that's what I would say. I think, you know, Cleopatra is a really important figure. And there are a lot of people inside and especially outside classics who are deeply invested in what we say about Cleopatra when it comes to race. And so I think she's a really important person for classicists to get right. And I don't think classicists generally talk about her in a sensitive way. And I don't even just mean sensitive in the sense that they have to be kind. I mean, they also need to be intellectually honest. And I think there's not a lot of intellectual honesty around Cleopatra in the way that classicists treat her. So that was part of what I was trying to do in my introduction is try to find a better way to talk about Cleopatra that acknowledges what she has meant to people and also tries to understand her better in her own world. We can move into Hellenistic Egypt then. So Alexander becomes a pharaoh, and then he dies, and then Ptolemy takes over and, and then there's institute changes you get a lot of syncretization of gods and cultures that like you, you get this kind of meshing mm-hmm. but even though you mesh it doesn't completely become one culture what were the feelings towards the greeks from the egyptians and what were the were there people who kind of took on a dual identity were they kind of were they all very standoffish so i was reading a conference proceeding from paparologists and and this one I, i'm sorry it's been a while and i forget his name but he had this really great statement where he said classes us tend to think that, you know, the Greeks thought about Egypt for centuries by looking at Herodotus rather than understanding their experience in places like Egypt. And I thought that was great because, you know, he did sort of say, you know, it's as if Greeks go to Egypt and they have this 300 year old travel guide or 200 year old travel guide rather than seeing what's actually happening on the ground. That kind of really fired up my interest in, again, kind of what I was saying before about what sources do we privilege and sort of act like are authoritative for centuries. (laughs) You know, I mean, people talk about Herodotus when they're talking about, you know, Greek thought hundreds of years later is just because we have so much of it. And anyway, so that's really what, what fired up my interest. Rather than thinking that Herodotus can speak for 400 years of Greek views on Egypt, what what would happen if we looked at Egypt itself under Greek rule? And again, I'm not a paparologist, but I was really lucky to get really, really kind and patient paparologists to help me negotiate some of this material because it's very technical when you start reading paparology and trying to put it together. I mean, I'm not certainly not the only one. Dorothy Thompson, Willie Clarissa, there have been some amazing paparologists who have certainly tried to connect the dots and write these more social histories accounts, but much of it is still really technical, meaning just, you know, an article on a single document. But trying to even get an entry into this world took me a very, very long time. But what what was most interesting to me is really the question that you had earlier, which is the boundary crossing, because it's just impossible, I think, to keep Greeks and Egyptians segregated in Egypt when you think of that world. That doesn't mean that there wasn't bias between the two groups. That doesn't mean that they didn't have a sense of the other, but it means that they are often living side by side. One of the things that's really important is that the Greeks, the immigration will increase under Alexander and former soldiers will often be given land grants in Egypt. And immigration during this time is predominantly men, or if it's going to be, let's say, single people, it's not going to be women. So you have a lot of these Greek men in Egypt and you start to see more and more intermarriages between Greek men and Egyptian women. And then in subsequent centuries or decades even, you start to have families for whom identification as either Greek or Egyptian is just simply not possible because of the nature of these families. So that's really what I wanted to think about. And, you know, I think Alexandria is really interesting, but Alexandria is also a really specific place. It's like a New York, you know, there's just things that happen there that might be different. There's a really large Jewish community, which makes things really different and diverse as well. But when you get out into the countryside, um, you can start to see some of these settled, they're called clerics, some of these settlers, and then some of these families. And that's really what I was interested in and trying to figure out. So in a family, and Willie Clarissa has done really great work on this, but in a family where you have individuals with both Greek and Egyptian names, what, what should we make of that? You have individuals in the Egyptian countryside that sometimes use Greek names and sometimes use Egyptian names. So it's kind of that complexity and that level of decision making that I was really interested in and trying not to write an authoritative account of, but just remind people that this, you know, the social experience of race can often be at such a micro level compared to some of the other ways that we think about it. And there's actually evidence 
evidence that women were better off identifying as Egyptian when they went to law courts. There's evidence that the Egyptian law court was um, more lenient toward women, let's say, or gave them more rights than the Greek one. So that's also a form of thinking about decision making. So a woman might choose to use an Egyptian court because she has an Egyptian name. She might also have a Greek name, but that might be less about sort of racial affiliation and more about a greater rights according to gender. You know, there's this one very famous woman, her name is Apollonia, and she has an Egyptian name as Samuthis. In the writings, you will absolutely see people divided. And they want to say, no, 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 she's Egyptian, but she was only playing at Greek sometimes. Or no, 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 she was Greek, but she only played Egyptian sometimes. And I'm, I'm not sure it would have been such, you know, so clear to her that she needed to be one or the other. You know, that I think it's just interesting how people, you know, view ancient identity and they want to think of her as essentially one thing and performing something else. But what if for her, she was essentially both things? But you get that much more in the documentary evidence or those possibilities, I think. It's fascinating because like, you know, in America, if you're half white, half black, you're basically black. Uh, you know you know what I'm trying to say? Like there's no like you can use e- either or to your advantage. You're basically in the modern perception, R- right or wrong. That's just kind of how it is. And it's very hard because I think in a lot of these documents, if we think about racial identity, we could think of, of racial identification, how I identify in the world. And then we could also think of the opposite process, which is, let's say, racial categorization. So I might identify myself a certain way, but you looking at me from the outside might put me in a specific category. And my identity publicly is a negotiation of that, what I think from myself versus what you perceive me to be. And you know, there's a lot of writing in this in the US when it comes to passing. That's why certain Americans felt like we had to introduce the one drop rule because they were so nervous that all of a sudden you couldn't absolutely definitively tell by appearance what people were. So that process, I mean, that was another thing I tried to get at a little bit in the book. So how can we understand the interaction between racial identification and racial categories? And what I wish we had to get back to your point is more information about how these people were perceived by outsiders. In other words, you know, if someone wrote on a tax document and took the identification of Greek, were they allowed to do that? You know, we have the identification. I don't know that we always know. I mean, I think we assume in certain ways, but it would be great to have more of that moment of interaction. And I think some taxes are actually declared in front of other people. So, you know, there is that interaction. Someone is watching you make a declaration, but I would love that interaction because I think those two aren't always the same, you know, how you identify yourself and how you are perceived, especially when it comes to state power. I mean, the government has very specific notions of what makes these categories. If we look at the census, it, you know, they try to give very, very concrete definitions of what certain things are. It doesn't always match what we think of those identities in personal terms. You talked about the ancient Jews and Jewish identity. There's some of that in your book as well. Is that also kind of not black and white in the sense that like there could have been a dual identity there as well? So there's a really interesting scholar in Jewish studies called Shia Cohen, and he's, he has this great article where it's how do you know a Jew when you see one in antiquity? And he tries to go through all of the ways in which Jewishness was defined. How did people categorize Jews? You know, how did people from the outside identify Jews? And that might be very different from the way that Jews identified themselves. But I think what he sort of pointed to is exactly what you're saying, that, that there is a certain kind of ambiguity about it. Roman writers point to certain things as Jewish practice, but it never seems to be definitive, not least because people can convert to Judaism. And what he suggested, and I think, you know, he's not the only one, but I think there is the word eudaios in Greek can mean, like Jewish identity today, a number of different things. It can mean, you know, you come from that part of the world. In other words, it can be a political or geographic identity. It can be a social identity, meaning you do certain practices. It can be a religious identity. So I think it's really difficult to know. Shia Cohen was really interested in those moments of crisis. When the Romans want to expel Jews from Rome, how do they know who to expel? I mean, it sounds terrible to just say it so black and white, but that is that moment of crisis. That's where people are clearly categorizing. And I think we just don't know. Some people think that there must have been a registry in antiquity, but I I could be wrong, but I don't think there's evidence for that. I mean, it's just really hard to know. What would that moment be like when when the state is trying to identify? And again, how does that interact with what people think of their own identities? I think Suetonius records at one point that trying to figure out there's a, a Jewish tax in antiquity, and that's the same kind of moment. Like, how would the Romans know who should pay this Jewish tax? And Suetonius records a moment where this, like, I think 90-year-old man or something is stripped to see if he's circumcised. You know, most people think that's probably not the way Romans determine that tax. But the fact that it's 
it's mentioned like that does suggest that there is a real difficulty in knowing who's Jewish. Shia Cohen talks about, you know, you might assume that if people lived in Jewish neighborhoods, you know, there are all these ways that we assume, but I think definitively it's a really tricky question. And probably because like you say, in, in, you know, in the diaspora, a lot of Jews are really using Greek culture and Greek. So there's that extra, you know, dimension to it. They're Jewish, they're Greek, and they're under the Romans. Um, so there's a, a lot of things going on. Herodotus mentions it a little bit. And there's, as you mentioned earlier, some problems with looking to Herodotus for a lot of things. But it made me think of that when you were talking about, like, the Romans didn't know how to find a Jew. Was there a sense that, like, people from this certain region tended to be this physical appearance? You know, what I would say is is part of, like, my writing on blackness and whiteness. I try to be nuanced about it in the race book. But I do think there's much better work being done now, um, including by this rising scholar named Sarah Derbu, where she's really trying to look at skin color in all its complexity. Because I do think physical characteristics contributed to racial thinking. However, it wasn't just skin color. I mean, skin color could be used. It's an empirical thing that people point to. But you can also have facial hair. Certainly clothing is a big deal. You know, what clothing people wear. If you wore pants or not. If you wore pants or not. Absolutely. And I I think, you know, I don't think that's any more critical than skin colors. So, but I think that you're right, that there are certain physical characteristics that are associated with a group. But I think that those are part of a kind of collection of what we might call cultural practices like clothing or food or religion. Um, So I would never say it doesn't matter at all. I will say it doesn't have the racial weight that it has today. It is part of a series of things. I think that the Romans, when they show slaves on the stage, I think they will often show Northern Europeans, which is kind of interesting if you think about the way that whiteness and Romans are deployed today among white supremacists who are often deeply attached to Northern Europe. There's some speculation that, you know, if you read love poetry in one of the poems, in Ovid, um, Corinna is dyeing her hair, bleaching her hair, maybe, I think. But in any event, there's there's some speculation that there was kind of a, a fad in Rome for blonde hair that would have come from slaves. So yeah, I think there's absolutely physical characteristics are, are part of, what would you say, that like the receptacle of features that are used to define race. Corinna has blonde hair in the, uh, the Ovid movie that comes out next week. Maybe, I didn't know if that was intentional. I, I can't remember what we know about her appearance, except at one point she tries to bleach or dye her hair and it almost all falls out. And Ovid's like really, really angry at her. <laughs> but there's a propertious poem as well where Cynthia seems to be doing some kind of color manipulation of her hair. And he ties it to these national settings. I think he says at one point you have a Belgian color, which means that, you know, she's, I guess she's using rouge or something like that. And so I think that there is a kind of way in which regions or groups, racial groups have certain qualities, but I think, you know, they're, they're part of a bigger collection of things. So how did the Greeks and Romans become white in our imagination then? Like at what point in history did that kind of start? It, it really starts when physical features become the defining element of race. And that that really happens in the like 18th, 19th, modern 18th, modern 19th centuries, when you have a real turn to biological science. And it was a way of trying to think about race, quote unquote, objectively, which is crazy. I mean, there's nothing objective about the way scientific race was defined. But there was this idea that if you defined people by physical qualities, it was more natural. You know, it wasn't like the same kind of social decision. But, you know, it comes at a time of European colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. So people were looking to define fundamental differences in ways that justified inequality. And so all of a sudden you have the physical body becoming much more important. And part of this is also the rise of natural sciences themselves, because during this time, you know, this is like the age of things like Darwin. I mean, people are just using science to explain the world in a way that they used to, let's say, use religion. So in earlier periods, you know, the Bible was really important for defining race. But this is that kind of moment where this the natural sciences are really assuming power in how people think about the world and how it works. And so human variation kind of got folded into that. And people start using then the human body to try to define different racial groups. And that really is where the concept of whiteness as a race emerges. And then, you know, people, people who were invested in defining this, generally speaking, Europeans and also Americans, in uniting this kind of white race, they often then started to reach back to the Greeks and Romans. So that's how the Greeks and Romans get implicated in it. Some of it through statuary, which people have talked about. So you have people who think about Greek statuary as recording, quote unquote, the ideal Caucasian body type. 
as if its goal was to sort of document a reality rather than say a god. <laughs> so six pack abs and then one inch penis. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You can tell what they were focused on. <laughs> Gotta have priorities, right? So yeah, so that's really when notions of race get tied to skin color is as this sort of 18th, 19th century interest in defining race through the human body rather than through the Bible. And also, you know, rather than things like language, I mean, there were other ways that people thought about race. And so, yeah, I would really say that is a modern invention. And then there's no question that the Greeks and Romans get pulled into it and become then the sort of origin and the example of how great the white race can be. And all of this is in quotation marks for people listening. So, you know, so it's not just a casual connection. It is absolutely essential to these people who are using biology, that it's not just about biology, they're also using then this really distorted understanding of history and projecting onto the Greeks and Romans then this idea that, you know, they identified as a white race, that they were the progenitors of a white race, none of which would have made sense to them. Was there any um, kickback to that? Or was this just kind of like the popular opinion as it went through and then it just became kind of like, quote unquote, known fact? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it was, I would say it was dominant, but I think that there are interesting moments of pushing back. And actually, it's such a great question you asked that because that's one of the things, you know, once we start documenting some of this in classics, which I think is the work of, you know, many of the people we were talking about, uh, people like Rebecca Futo Kennedy and Curtis Dozier. I mean, I think once we document more of how this worked, I would like to see some of the nuance come in because part of my work right now, I'm looking at the connections of eugenics and classics. And, you know, there are some heroes, you know, there are some people who are really trying to speak back to some of the ways that the Greeks and Romans were being a appropriated and co-opted. And I would like to have some of those people's narratives be a little bit more apparent as well. I mean, I have zero problem with really documenting this dominant view that is still held by many people, including modern hate groups. But I would love to see some of this counter narrative and a lot of it by people of color. I mean, let's be honest, you know, there's a lot of really, really good work and really pushing back. Frederick Douglass pushed back against scientific racism in a huge way. So I'd love to see that story being told as well. And then I guess that'll lead us to the final topic topic, uh, which you wrote a piece on in Eidoline as well. I'll put the link in the show notes on Black Athena and Classic's terrible response to it. Yeah. And boy, if you thought I could talk about Hellenistic Egypt, right? <laughs> you don't know Black Athena. Um, okay. So I will, I will try to keep it short. So Martin Bernal was a scholar who's actually trained in Chinese studies and a linguist. And he really got invested in trying to rethink the origins of Greek civilization. He made the argument that Greek civilization and sort of the ways that the Greeks thought about their own, the origins of their own civilization was much more, for lack of a better word, multicultural than what classicists would give it credit for. So Martin Bernal argued that in the, the Middle Bronze Age, so quite early in the formation of Greek culture, that the Greeks had been fundamentally influenced by the Phoenicians and the Egyptians. And he argued that the Greeks knew it, basically, I mean, I'm kind of simplifying, but he argued that the Greeks knew it, but that classical scholars in the same period we talked about before in the 18th and 19th centuries started to deny that connection. And they started to kind of write that out of history and produce a model of Greek origin that he called the Aryan model, which said that classical scholars scholars during this period were really invested in this kind of Greek miracle, that Greece had emerged of its own accord and had come to greatness because of that exceptionalness. Um, and he really wanted to put Greece back and, and show that it had emerged, again, with very, very strong influences from Egyptian and Phoenician culture. And, you know, so there were a lot of different responses to that. One of them, which I think is the most disingenuous, which classicists love to do, and I've had this so much with my own work, so I can speak from experience, is they will tell you everything that's right in your work we already knew everything else is wrong <laughs> and that's sort of what they said to him and it wasn't untrue in the sense that people had you know talked about Phoenician and Egyptian influence but I think you know they didn't really give him credit for fundamentally inviting the world into that conversation. You know, if you asked people generally what they thought of the Greeks, they would have a very narrow view of it. And so he really popularized this notion that the Greeks were actually part of a Mediterranean world. He was also, and this is the part that I, I think is a little bit more complicated. He also thought that the influence had not just been cultural, but that in fact, there had been moments of colonization by the Phoenicians and the Egyptians in early Greek history. 
history. And I think some classicists who engaged with him maybe more uh, more openly found that problematic. And I think that that is tricky because I think, you know, a lot of this evidence that he's using, which is quite early on, are things like grave goods. And so how can you say a grave good arrived because of this colonization that we have no other evidence for versus economic trade? So were classicists defensive because they didn't want to think of Greece as colonized? Probably. Um, but is it clear that, that, that it was that kind of top-down relationship? You know, again, I'm not an expert in the Bronze Age, but I, I think that that was the more difficult part of his thesis, that he didn't just stop at saying there was fundamental contact between all of these groups. He really wanted to prove these moments of colonization. So when people engaged with him, they sort of, you know, disagreed with him. And there are archaeologists, and he says openly in his book, you know, most archaeologists now think that cultural change happens because of indigenous development. But I believe that culture changes when groups invade one another. And so, you know, there is this way in which his whole model is actually quite 19th century. So he was basically arguing that Cadmus was a real person and found at Thebes. Is that, is that mm-hmm. from Phoenicia? Okay. And then the other thing, so but cu- cultural interaction can can come about from trade, which is what the Greeks and the Phoenicians were yeah. very yeah. good at. <laughs> so like, yeah, it doesn't have to be conquest or colonization. It could be interacting with each other in markets. Exactly. I mean, they also had joint colonies together as well. Exactly. And who knows what colonization meant at that moment as well? You know, I mean, he sort of assumed that it meant the same thing ahistorically, but Greek colonies, as you're suggesting, are very different from our modern idea of colonization. So it's kind of really hard to figure out what to make of that. And again, I'm, I'm not an expert in the Bronze Age, but that seemed to me and, and his insistence on that particular dynamic rather than sort of what you're saying, which I, I think would have been in some ways easier with the evidence. But he also used things like linguistic evidence, you know, that there's a trace of this in language, which must have been introduced by conquest. And I think, you know, it seems like there would be other ways that languages change. So for me, he kind of boxed himself in with that particular emphasis in his work. But there's no question that although some classicists just sort of said, we knew that already, we knew that already, you know, that there had been this fundamental contact, even if they didn't agree with colonization, I think that was really underestimated what Bernal did. And I think that was quite disingenuous because clearly Black Athena became a global phenomenon. I mean, it was on the cover of Newsweek. People were just so entranced by this thesis that the Greeks had not been this self-inventing exceptional group of people, but that they actually lived in the Mediterranean. And I think that classicists could have and should have given him more credit for that moment. But, you know, there are a lot of other things. I mean, Martin Bernal had a very contentious personality. He loved nothing more than arguing bitterly with people. And so I think there were, you know, there's just a lot of stories under the surface that are, I think, sort of interesting. A classicist with a contentious personality that likes to argue bitterly with other people? I, I didn't think that existed. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. So now you know why their feelings were so hurt, right? Because they always argue so fairly. But, you know, and a lot of classicists were just really annoyed that he came in from this outsider field, you know, and so they would sort of say, you know, what, what right does he have to tell us he was trained in Chinese studies? And, you know, so there was a lot of ways in in which he and his personality, and not just his personality, but the way that this book was received, that just sent classicists back behind the walls. You know, I, there are many classicists who would say to me, you know, if he's just going to call us racist, I'm not even going to talk to him. And it was such a small minded way to read the book. But I think, you know, a lot of people felt that a field founded in racism had a lot to answer for. Many classicists felt way too personally offended by that and might have learned structurally how to talk to that. But it just didn't happen. And so after Black Athena, that was part of, as I mentioned much earlier in the episode, that's also why my work on race, and no one wanted to use the word race after Black Athena, no one absolutely no one. It's continued to haunt the field. I think that's why I wrote the Adelon piece, because I think that some of the stuff that's going on now, you know, with the the hate groups and the white supremacy, you know, classics had an opportunity in the 80s and 90s to really not just change itself, but change its image, so to speak, and change the way that people talked about the ancient world. And they did not, you know, most of the stuff I read during that period that was reported in national media made classicists look conservative. I don't just mean politically conservative, but defensive and yes, racist. I wouldn't have defended 95% of the stuff I heard classicists say during that period. So it was just not a good look. It was not a good moment. Well, there's still a lot of work to do, I guess is what I would say. I It's been exciting to see things like Adelon appear 
and people using the word race. However, I'm involved in a volume right now, and I asked a scholar who I admire very much to appear in the volume, and the scholar wrote back to me and said, race is not appropriate for antiquity. There was no such thing as race in antiquity, basically, I'm paraphrasing. And I just, I don't understand how that view continues to exist. So I think there is a lot more educating of itself that classics needs to do. Not only, I mean, there's a lot of really important work to be done in terms of access and who classicists are, are, but I also just think conceptually, people still do not understand what race is. And that's my biggest disappointment at this moment in 2020. I didn't think I would still be confronted with that. And it's, um, it's going to be a barrier for classics. So that's what I would say. Just the biggest problem is just like getting over the popular perception that it's not uh, an elitist white male or woman thing. That they're not all Boris Johnsons or or Victor Davis Hansons, and and even that race isn't biological. You know, I mean, I've said to you, you know, I publish, uh, you know, that article on DNA. I mean, I am sure the majority of classicists still think that race is determined by human biology, rather than a social construction about the ways that we think about human biology. I mean, it's it's just amazing to me how little classicists have really internalized the social constructedness of race. You know, it, it's just so important to many of them to continue to say race is biological, ethnicity is social. And it's convenient. And sometimes things that are convenient last forever because they're so convenient and they work so well, but it is such a disservice. And it's just shocking to me, I, I would have to say, in terms of intellectual honesty. You know, I, I just don't understand. But, you know, I have to be careful because I think it took a long time to move that way between sex and gender in antiquity. So I should be careful. Getting away from the biological notion of sex and understanding gender as a social construction is not a bad analogy for what classics still has to do when it comes to race. So let's end it on a positive note, though. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the one thing I would say to be positive is sort of the third thing <laughs> that I wanted to really do in my race book is to ask better questions. And that's what I would leave it with, because I think... Sometimes when people read the race book, you know, I've had people disappointed that I don't go more into detail about this or that or the other. And the race book was really about trying to figure out a structure for thinking and a way to ask questions. And that's where I would end it positively. I mean, I love questions. I actually have my students write questions and I like, grade them on questions. I mean, questions and sometimes are so much more important to me than answers. I'm really invested in that process. I'm, I'm really invested in questions. And so I think there's a line in the book that people don't take seriously, which I just say, you know, this book is, a, is more about asking better questions than giving answers. And um, it's not a throwaway line. It's absolutely what I wanted for that book was how can we throw everything out and think about better ways of asking? And there's a lot more of that being done now. That's, I guess, the positive way I would end. There's a lot of really good stuff that's coming up, asking completely different kinds of questions. I highly recommend this book. It's great. The way you lay it out, it's very well presented. I'll put links to the book in the show notes as well. Well, thank you for doing this, finally. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.